Kathy Floyd, we're ready to begin, please. Good morning. That was a little louder than I thought I would be. I hope everyone's had a good week this week, and I'm glad that you have gathered together with us this morning as we worship the Lord together. I'll invite you to take a look at the bulletin, a couple of announcements I will uh, highlight. Uh, no uh, midweek activities this week due to fall break. Uh, next Sunday, October 8th, we will observe uh, communion uh, as well as collect our uh, benevolence offering, so keep that in mind. I'll also make note that beginning on October 11th, we will begin a new Wednesday night schedule. Uh, we will have handbells at 5 and adult choir rehearsal at 6. Other activities have been temporarily suspended until uh, suppers can be resumed, uh, so make note of that uh, small adjustment to the calendar. And also coming up on October 13th, uh, the uh, Chattooga High School football team will be here for uh, supper. Uh, contact Kathy Floyd to volunteer to help with that. And I hope you've already made note that on October 15th, Horizon will celebrate our 31st anniversary. So, and there's several other announcements in there as well, so make sure that you read your bulletin and stay up to date on everything that's going on and upcoming. But again, I'm glad that you are here this morning. Now, may we worship together. If your memory of ch church hymns goes as far back as the Broadman hymnal, you will probably remember our call to worship this morning, Only Believe. Please stand as we sing.
this morning, I'm going to tell you a story about two brothers. Okay, One day, one brother was in his room building a model airplane, and he was asked to go outside and rake leaves in the yard. And he told his parents, hmm, I don't have time to do that. I'm working on my model airplane, and I want to finish it today. So the parent turned around, left the room, and went to the other brother. He found that brother watching TV, and he said, there's lots of leaves in the yard. Will you please go out and rank them? Here are the bags. You know what that brother said? He said he would do it. And so the parent left, and the first brother started thinking about what his parent asked him to do. And he said, you know what? I can rake the leaves, and I can still finish my model airplane. So he went out by himself and raked the leaves. And when his parent returned home, he said, where's your brother? And he said, I don't know, inside watching TV, I guess. And when the parent went in, of course, the brother was watching TV. So which brother was the parent happy with? Mm -hmm. In the Bible lesson today, Jesus told a similar, similar story to show how people obey what God has called them to do. In Jesus' parable of the two sons, the father asked both sons to go out and work in his vineyard. Just as the two boys in the story, one son said no, but went and worked, and the other son said yes, but did not go. In telling the story, Jesus wants us to realize that what we say is important, but what we do is even more important. So Jesus wants us to answer yes, but he also wants us to go and do the work. So it's one thing just to say, yes, I love someone, but it's something else completely different to say, yes, I love, and show that you're loving that person, okay? Your actions need to match your words, all right? Let's pray. God, sometimes we say yes, but our actions say no. Help us to be faithful to do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For our next uh, hymn, we're singing a couple of stanzas from Footsteps of Jesus, and that will be followed by a couple of stanzas from He Keeps Me Singing. Please stand as we sing together. <laughs>
Our scripture for this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd. For all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. You may remain seated for our offertory hymn number 669.
Please stand for the doxology. <laughs>
throughout the Gospels, we get to see lots of different characteristics of Jesus, different sides of Jesus, different approaches of Jesus. And the side of Jesus we get in our text today isn't the easygoing, gentle Jesus that goes around healing and encouraging people. But instead, the side of Jesus that we get in our text today is a bold, radical Jesus who isn't afraid to stand up when things aren't right and say something about it. Jesus is not afraid to challenge the status quo when the situation calls for it. And what we have in today's episode of Jesus encountering the temple leadership is a Jesus who has, for lack of a better term, been causing some problems for them, to say the least. If you back up here in this chapter and read the passages prior, you will see that just the day before the episode that we've read this morning, Jesus ransacked the temple court. He came into the temple and saw that the temple practices had been hijacked and the way that things were operating were just not right. Jesus had shown up at the temple and seen the money changers and everything that was going on and how people were being uh, treated poorly and how some were being ostracized and how people were being fleeced for every thing that they had and just the the general way that things were running, Jesus was not happy. So Jesus overturns tables. He spills money. He releases the animals that are being sold for sacrifice. He creates quite the scene. And needless to say, that did not go over well, to say the least. Because Jesus wasn't being polite and soft-spoken. But rather, Jesus was angry. He was righteously angry. And he had a point to make. He was greatly troubled that those who were running the temple had lost sight of what temple worship was supposed to be about. What was going on in the temple was not okay, and Jesus left no doubt about it. He made himself abundantly clear that they had lost sight of what the purpose of coming to the temple was was. And now the next day, after causing all this chaos, Jesus is back at the temple. He's back teaching. And the chief priest and the elders and the other religious leaders there at the temple, they're still reeling from what Jesus did the day before. And I can only imagine they're thinking to themselves, what? Is he going to do today? Who does this guy think he is? This poor peasant carpenter has been wandering around saying all this stuff, getting people to follow him, but who does he think he is? Why does he think he's in charge? Why does he think he's important enough to get people to listen to him? Just who does this guy think he is? And if the religious leaders who challenged Jesus on this day had some of our phrases, they might have called him a traitor, a pot stirrer, a troublemaker, maybe even a blasphemer. They were not happy with Jesus. How dare this guy not just shut his mouth, show up, and toe the line? As Jesus was there the day before, turning over tables and causing chaos, some might have even labeled him a terrorist. 
to them, all they see is trouble. And it goes back even further than that. If you go back a little bit before the temple incident, Jesus came riding into town in a passage that should be familiar to us with people crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, treating Jesus like a king, treating him like he's the guy in charge, treating him like he matters. So now... They want to know who's in charge because surely it ain't this guy. Not this guy causing all this trouble. Jesus was one who greatly valued tradition. One who observed tradition. As we have explored not that long ago, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill the law. Tradition and protocol were means to an end. They were not the end all be all. The law itself wasn't the end all be all, but rather paved a way for people to understand the one who was to come. Jesus. And his teachings, his way of life, all of it pointed above and beyond man-made rules and regulations, man-made wants and desires to something more. Jesus transcended all of this. Jesus pointed the way to the fulfillment of God's kingdom. Jesus paved the way to redemption. And the issue that is at the root of the conflict here is that those in charge of the temple think they've got it all figured out. They think they hold the proverbial keys to the kingdom. They think they are in charge. They think they've got the control. They think they get to make the decisions about who's in, who's out, what God really wants, what God is all about. But Jesus is there to break the bad news to them. No, nope, not quite. You're not in charge. This side of Jesus, this bold, challenging in your face, Jesus makes us uncomfortable. We prefer our images of Jesus as the tender shepherd, as Jesus holding our hand and comforting us. And while that is most certainly something that Jesus does, as episodes like these show us, He's also not afraid to call us out. He's also not afraid to remind us that he's in charge, or that at least he should be. He's not afraid to remind us of our human unwillingness to accept what God is up to. He's not afraid to challenge us to see outside the box. And the chief priest could simply not handle the idea that maybe, just maybe, they were wrong. Maybe, just maybe, there is something to what this Jesus is saying. No, they can't have that. They can't accept that. They won't accept that. Instead, what they want to do is derail Jesus' ministry as fast as they can. We've got to shut this guy down. Because his message was a direct challenge to them. He was questioning their very authority, their ability to be in charge. He was questioning their very notions of who they were and what they were supposed to do.
They want to know, essentially, who died and made you king, Jesus? They want to know, who do you think you are, that you think you're in charge, that you're the boss, that you can tell us what to do? No, 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 we can't have that. So they tried to trap him. They ask him a question. Under whose authority are you doing this stuff? Knowing full well that if Jesus claimed that he was acting on God's authority, they could claim that he was a heretic. And they could execute him for that. They had that power. That was in their purview. After all, they're in charge of he teaches something that goes against what they say, they can kill him and do away with him. Spoiler alert, that's exactly what they end up doing eventually. Or, if he comes out and says, well, I don't really have any authority, I just think I should be in charge, you know, if he doesn't have any ground to stand on, at the very least they can kick him out of the temple, that's in their authority. They can send him back to, to Galilee and keep him quiet and get rid of him and maybe he won't cause them any more trouble. At this point, I think that they would take either solution as long as they can stop dealing with him. But Jesus, he's too smart for that. You're not ever going to beat Jesus in a battle of wits. Just ain't going to happen. So he turns the question back on him. He says, I'll tell you what. I hear your question. I'll ask you one of my own. You can answer mine. I'll answer yours. And he throws a theological question at them about John's baptism. That Jesus knows full well they can't answer. If they agreed that John's authority came from God, then they would have to admit that they had failed to respect and listen to God's message. That they would have failed to have done what God had told them to do through John. Not a good option if you're trying to prove that Jesus is wrong, that John was wrong. You don't want to turn around and go, well, yeah, he was right, we didn't listen, our bad. No, they're not going to do that. Or, if they held their ground and verbally acknowledged that they believed that John wasn't a prophet, and they threw John the Baptist under the bus, so to speak, and said, no, he, he was a fraud, he was a fake. Well, John had a whole lot of supporters who weren't that hard to rile up. And the text even tells us they were afraid of what would happen if those folks got upset. So what Jesus has done here is he has put these authority figures in a lose-lose situation. He's outsmarted them. They're only left with one answer to Jesus' question. I don't know. We don't know. And when I think about this episode, I imagine the look on their face is kind of similar to the look on my kid's face when I asked them what they learned in school that day. I don't know. What'd you ask me? What? So Jesus takes these folks who think they're going to outsmart him, and he outsmarts them and proves that they don't know as much as they think they do. So Jesus seizes the moment. He gets a chance here to turn the tables, figuratively this time. If they couldn't identify the authority behind John's baptism, then what makes them think they're qualified to judge the authority behind Jesus' actions? Basically, if you couldn't figure out what was going on with John, how can you presume to know what's going on with me? So Jesus is basically saying, I'm not going to tell you whose authority I'm working under. I'm not going to tell you who put me in charge. 
because, well, honestly, you're too dense to figure it out. But it's an important question. Who's in charge? It's a question we have to ask ourselves. It's important to consider who we grant authority in our lives. And it's important to consider who and what we try and exercise authority over. How we answer those questions matters. Because we're just as likely in our day and age to have a false sense of what authority is, who has it, or who should have it. We're just as likely as those in Jesus' day to believe that we've got it all figured out, that we know the right way and nobody else knows anything. We're just as likely get so caught up in thinking we know everything that we fail to see what God is trying to teach us. It's like I tell my kids, and it's a long-standing tradition because I was told the same thing when I was a child, but, you know, maybe you should go get a job while you know everything so you can be very successful. But eventually... As we mature and get older, the more we actually learn, the more we find out what we don't know. And that's Jesus' sentiment here, is when you think you've got it all figured out, you're going to miss an opportunity to see what God is up to. That's what the chief priests and the scribes and the elders in the temple were missing out. They were so obsessed with their own authority and their position, they they were missing an opportunity to grow and to learn and to follow Jesus. And those temptations are there for us as well. So Jesus' challenge to them is the same challenge Jesus offers to us. Honestly, ask ourselves, who's in charge? Whose authority do we live and work under? Who's guiding our action? Is it ourselves? Is it some false sense of superiority? Is it something of this world or is it of Jesus? This episode serves to remind us that Jesus taught with the very authority of God. And Jesus should remain our highest authority. That at the end of the day, there's lots of people in charge in our life. Parents, employers, law enforcement, rules, laws, regulations. There's lots of things, lots of people that exist for guiding and forming our lives, and that's well and good. But at the end of the day, the number one authority that we are accountable to, the number one person who should be in charge is Jesus. So as we seek to understand everything that's going on in our world, the various issues and challenges that we face as individuals, as a church, as a community, as a nation, as a world. We have to go back to that question. Who's in charge? So we have to weigh the teachings of Jesus against everything We have to make a conscious effort to seek Christ's leadership. Because we live in a changing world with issues and questions and possibilities that were unknown in biblical times. But Jesus' guidance, Jesus' authority still holds. 
His continued presence still exists. Christ can still lead and guide and show us the way. If we will only put Him in His right place in our life, which is firmly in charge. And this episode here at the temple is important enough that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all mention it. But then Matthew does something that's unique only to Matthew's gospel. Jesus goes from this teaching, this questioning, and transitions into a parable to drive home his point. In the parable, you've got a farmer who instructs his two sons to go out and work in the family vineyard. One of the sons says, Nah, Dad, I'm good. I'm paraphrasing. That's not exactly what it says. But he says, No, I'm good. I, I don't feel like going to work today. But the son sits there doing whatever he's doing and I guess contemplates what he said and comes to the conclusion, you know what? I better get up and go to work. The second son says, yes, sir, dad, absolutely. I will get up and go to work. But then he never shows up. And Jesus asked, which one of these two actually did the will of their dad? And there's only one right answer to this question. The one who actually went to work. The one who was hesitant at first, but showed up. But see, Jesus has got them in a corner again. Because if they answer the question with the right answer, what he's got them doing is admitting they were wrong. Because they would be admitting they're the son who said with their mouth that they would follow God and would be obedient, but then didn't do it. Didn't follow through. These people claim to be God's people. They claim to be in charge and operate with God's authority. But they're doing so in word only. Because they refuse to accept what God is doing in Jesus. The son who said no at first, he represents all those who may have violated the law. Those who for a long time may have said, I don't know about this God thing. I don't know, I'm just doing my own thing but then came around, repented, and followed Jesus. And Jesus is very boldly saying that God would rather have these over here that have made the mistakes, that have done all of this junk, who finally get what God's doing and accept me, than all of you who may live these picture-perfect lives and talk a good game about God with your mouth, but refuse to accept my leadership. And I imagine that did not sit well at all. Especially when he, to make his point, brings up two of the most despised classes of people that existed in the ancient world, prostitutes and tax collectors. He looks at these highly esteemed religious leaders, the keepers of the temple, and says, prostitutes and tax collectors are getting in my kingdom before you are. And this all goes back to their earlier question. Who's in charge? Where's your authority come from? Jesus is reminding them again 
that time and time again, God has tried to get their attention. God has tried to remind them that God is in charge, not them. But they haven't listened. They rejected John the Baptist. While all kinds of people came to him, repented, and were baptized. These folks had seen the revival that had sparked from his message. But they refused to believe John's message about a greater one to come, Jesus. They just couldn't let go of their preconceived notions of what God was about to see what God really was about. They couldn't let go of the idea that they were in right, they were in charge, they got the final say to accept the fact that God, not them, was the ultimate authority. This whole episode speaks to any day and age. Jesus took it to these folks because they were too stubborn to accept reality and realize that there was a better way. That God was trying to do something with them. They were tripping over their own feet to deny it. Likewise, as the church faces the challenges of the 21st century, many Christians and churches find themselves in the same boat, getting in their own way by refusing to acknowledge who's really in charge. By doubling down on the way things may have always been while denying the reality that maybe God is up to something new. Looking at this episode Many who weren't even allowed at the temple under the policies that were in place had begun to follow Jesus. Their path looked a lot different than the religious zealots who were in the temple. Many had said no to God's ways, but now were changing their hearts and following suit. You can read the scriptures and find plenty of people, but as I was reading and writing, I, I thought of Zacchaeus. How when he met Jesus, not only did he meet Jesus and change his life, but he immediately put it back into action and paid back everybody he had ever swindled. You've got Matthew. who is also a former tax collector who left all that behind and is now following Jesus all around the country. There's many women, both named and unnamed, who supported his work. Women who were largely subjugated to second-class citizenship in their society found a place where their voice was heard. They found a source of authority that respected them. All of these had chosen to follow Jesus, helping and loving others, living a grace-first lifestyle and revealing to others how to be forgiven, giving their hearts to walking in the way of God is revealed in the authority of Jesus Christ. So where does that leave us? What can we point to that sets us apart and identifies us as true followers of Jesus? If people judge us honestly by what we do, what conclusions will they come to? Will we be judged as ones who truly walk in the way of Jesus, giving Christ charge of our life? Or more like those in the temple who talked a good talk, but otherwise had really nothing to show for? Do we live in the vain hope that maybe people will take our word for it regardless of what we do?
Or do we put our beliefs into action and submit fully to Jesus' authority in our life? I imagine if we're truthful with ourselves, we could probably all confess that sometimes we're so concerned about sounding good, looking good, feeling good, making good, that we don't get around to actually being good. Especially if it means to being open to something we don't like or is different than what we've experienced before. I suspect if we're honest, a lot of us would rather follow our own authority and our own way versus fully giving ourselves over to Jesus' authority in our life. But that's what Jesus challenges us to ponder if we're going to live authentically as Christians. Are we living the faith? Are we loving the people? Are we walking the walk? If somebody asks us, who's in charge? Can we honestly answer, Jesus? That's a good question. It's a question that's as important now as it's ever been. So who's in charge? How would you answer? Respond as you may feel led this morning. Amen. Please stand as we sing hymn number one hundred uh, five hundred eighty eight. I know whom I have believed. Susan offers our benediction this morning. Uh, Zeke has been talking to me for a while now about how he has 
come to accept Jesus into his heart and wants to give his life to the Lord. And he came to me this morning before church ever got started and said, I am ready to be baptized and let everybody know that I have made a commitment to follow Christ. Zeke knows who's in charge of his life. And I am so proud of him, and, and I love him, and I hope that all of you are as proud of him and love him as much as I do and his family does. But he comes this morning, if it is the pleasure of the church, uh, to ask to be a candidate for baptism and membership in Horizon Baptist Fellowship. So if you accept uh, that, uh, give me an amen. amen. If you don't like it, get over it. I uh, don't want to hear from you. Uh, but uh, uh, I am proud of you. We, we love you. And uh, I look forward to getting that uh, scheduled on a day that all of his, uh, his family can be here. But we will get to do that soon. Let us pray. Our Father, let us answer who's in charge of us. Help us to seek Christ's leadership each day. Help us to practice what we preach and to do your will. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. 